Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, we had an awesome night last night. I see some new faces tonight. And uh, we saw many people get healed. People were touched in the presence of God. And you need to believe with us tonight that that's going to happen again. Amen. How many need a touch from God? Amen. In the midst of uh, what the Lord wants to share with us today, we're just going to be led by the Spirit and let the Spirit of the Lord do His work. And uh, can we believe together for something supernatural? Yes. Praise God. How many know He's here? Yes. And surrendering to Him is a wonderful thing. Just Faith is just surrendering. Just giving, giving yourself over to the presence of God. Well, tonight I'm speaking on, I'm going to share, this is what the Lord put on my heart, to share about the spirit of Elijah. Everybody say the spirit of Elijah. If you have a Bible, I'm going to get you to turn. I don't know how much you know about this spirit, but uh, uh, Malachi chapter 4, if you go there. Malachi chapter 4, <laughs> verses 5 and 6. This, Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, or if you're Italian, you can say Malachi. Um, it's the last book of the Old Testament, and, and uh, just before 400 years of silence. God does, God's not going to talk for 400 years to his people. And, uh, and the last thing he says to the people of God before he shuts up for 400 years, uh, it, how many know that might be pretty important? Yeah, come on. And so, so we're going to look at it, and then we're going to spring into something that uh, is to today. And God's going to say some things about what he's doing today. Um, I'm a bit of a prophetic pe preacher. I, I didn't say pathetic. I said prophetic. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it, it's important to know what's happening right now, right? So this is a little, wee bit different than last night. But if you came to get healed, you can still get healed tonight. Um, Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5 says, Behold, this is the Lord speaking through the prophet Malachi, 400, uh, between uh, 400 years before he's silent, he says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and the dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. And uh, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. How many know that the earth isn't going to be struck with a curse? That the, the spirit of Elijah is going to be released. Amen. Now, now in... <laughs> Luke chapter, woo, Luke, Luke chapter, Luke chapter one verse seventeen. I'm just going to get you to look at a few scriptures here. Luke chapter one and verse seventeen. Your Bible says uh, says this. <clears throat> Speaking of John the Baptist, remember Elizabeth? Elizabeth is M Mary's cousin, and she gives, she's get, gets pregnant in her old age with John the Baptist. And it says in verse 17, Luke 1, 17, speaking of John the Baptist, He will also go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So Malachi says... He says, before the great and the dreadful day of the Lord, there's going to be released the spirit of Elijah. Elijah is actually a spirit that comes upon the, uh, 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 it's for the church, it's for the people of God, right? So, so uh, we know that the spirit of Elijah came in the first coming on John the Baptist. The Bible says the spirit of Elijah would come before the great and before the dreadful day of the Lord. Those are two different days. The, the great day of the Lord was the first coming of Jesus. The dreadful day of the Lord is the second coming of Jesus. Right. Why is the second coming of Jesus a dreadful day? Because if you're not saved, there's no more opportunity. So it's a dreadful day. So Malachi prophesied before the great and the dreadful day of the Lord that there would be released a spirit of Elijah. So we know that the spirit of Elijah was on John the Baptist before the first coming of the Lord. That means that before Jesus comes back the second time, 
there's going to be a release of the spirit of Elijah, not on one individual, but on a group of people to, to issue in the second coming of the Lord. And you're here tonight, and I'm here to tell you prophetically, you're part of that group. You are part of that group that is going to be used uh, uh, to bring in the second coming of the Lord. Now, go, we, it's important to understand what things were like um, when Elijah came on the scene. So if you go into 1 Kings chapter 17, we're just going to start talking about some stuff and let the Spirit of God do what He needs to do. Amen? You okay tonight? 1 yes. <laughs> Kings, actually go to 16. 1 Kings chapter 16, and it says that there was a king over Israel, and his name was Ahab. And in verse 30 it says, 1 Kings 16 verse 18. Now Ahab was the son of Omri, and did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. He was the worst king over the people of God in history. He did more evil than any other, the Bible says he did more evil as a leader than any other leaders put together before him. And one of the things he did was look, it says, it says this, it says, And it came to pass, verse 31, And it came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam. Now the sins of Jeroboam, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you what they are. If you back up to 1 Kings chapter 12, the, the sins of Jeroboam are listed here. And I'm just going to read you the sins of Jeroboam. Now it's important to understand what the leaders were like right on. in the day that Elijah was released. Come on. Because it's going to be similar Come on. today. Right on. And when you see the parallel of what's happening in our earth and in this nation right now, you can put together and see that the spirit of Elijah is being released. Okay? So, so it says in, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 12, these were the sins of Jeroboam. Remember, the king of Israel considered the sins of Jeroboam trivial. Didn't consider them even important. And this is what he did. This Jeroboam dude. He did this. Verse 28. Therefore the king asked advice and made two calves of gold and said to the people, It is too much for you to go to Jerusalem, because that's where they worship. Here are your gods, O Israel, which uh, brought you up from the land of Egypt. And he set one up in Bethel and one he put in Dan. These are golden images. These are calves that made out of gold, right? And then in verse 30, now this thing became a sin for the people who went to worship before the one as far as Dan. He made shrines on the high places and he made priests from every class of people who were not the sons of Levi. Jeroboam ordained a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month, like the feast that was in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did at Bethel, sacrificing to the calves, those golden things, that he had made. So basically, there's five things in this list that Jeroboam did. He, number one, he changed the object of worship from God to golden images or to material things. Number two, he changed the place where they worship. You could just, you could, it didn't matter where they worship. They were to worship at the temple, but they didn't worship at the temple more. He, he made other places. Number three, he changed the priesthood. <laughs> There was a designated priesthood in the Old Testament, and he changed it. Number four, he changed the time of worship. And number five, he changed, he, he uh, yeah, number four, he changed the time of worship. And then, uh, in a nutshell, the four things that he changed are, he made self-will worship. Okay, so this, the sin of Jeroboam was this, that he said, we can worship any way we want. Anytime we want, with anybody we want, and do it any way we want. And that was the sin of Jeroboam. When, when Ahab became king, he considered those sins trivial. That that doesn't even matter. So go back to, with me to 1 Kings chapter 17. So it was pretty bad. It's kind of like today. What's happened over the last 25 years in this country is we've made worship any way we want. Come on. Right? 
We've changed, we've, we, we've, we've said this isn't important and this isn't important, nothing's important. You can do it any way you want, you can do it any time you want, you can do it in, in any structure you want. But there are things that are important to God in worship, right? So the day in which Elijah was about to birth out and become known in the land, there was, there was people saying, you can't tell me how to worship, you can't tell me uh, what to do and how I do it, it it's my individual individual style it's what I want to do and corporate worship isn't important I can stay home and watch TV I can do this any way I want those were the sins of Jeroboam so <clears throat> Ahab becomes king of Israel and he doesn't he, he considers the sins of Jeroboam trivial and what does he do he goes over and it says in verse 31 and it came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat that he took as a wife Jezebel, the daughter of Esbel, king of the Sidonians, and he went and served Baal, and he worshipped him. Then he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. So what does Ahab do? He considers worshiping material things as trivial. He considers it doesn't matter how you worship, the time you worship or anything is trivial. That, that doesn't matter. He goes over to a foreign country called Sidon, and he marries a woman who's a Baal worshiper, and I'm going to tell you what that is. He marries this Baal worshiper, brings her back, and they set up Baal worship in the nation. Now, over the last number of years, this is what you need to understand, our country has entered into the sins of Jeroboam. But now we're in a state where the, the leadership in our country is bringing Baal worship into this nation. Now, Baal worship is this. Literally, it was, uh, it, and this is why it was so detestable to God, when, people, when, when uh, Ahab did this, Baal worship was, you when, when you worship Baal, you place children in the hands of this statue over fire. And the children were thrown into the fire uh, by this god called, called Baal. And, and so the children were sacrificed on the altar of fire of worship to this false god. Baal was the goddess of fertility. So this was actually a curse that had come into the country through Jezebel to cause the next generation to be defiled. Come on, come on. So we live in a country, but you have to understand that this defilement was sexually related. There was sexual perversion and sexual things attached to uh, infiltrate and defile the next generation and then they were sacrificed. We are living in an era and in a time when the sins of Jeroboam are considered trivial compared to what is happening in our nation today. In our nation today, we are, we are sacrificing the next generation in a sexually perverted transgender generation teaching and training and sacrificing uh, through fertility gods the generation which is about to come on the scene when that happens in a nation God doesn't get as excited when Jeroboam sins are you know God will tolerate a nation worshiping idols and materialism and the things of this world but when a nation starts to sacrifice the next generation on the altar of fire and passion through sexual sexual deviant weirdness that is when the spirit of the Lord brings forth the spirit of Elijah and in this hour and in this time this this which is happening in our school systems and I'm prophesying now what is happening in our school systems is the same as what is happening in the days of Elijah the sacrifice is the same the worship is the same and at all costs it doesn't matter what happens to the next generation they need to be twisted in sexual perversion and sacrificed on an altar in order for the power of Baal worship to be effective in the land but God has a spirit that is being loosed in the church to combat and release against that spirit and cause that spirit to come down and we are part of that generation so you need to give Jesus praise that something is coming forth in this land Canada that's going to bring healing to the nations of the world 
the devil is doing everything to get this nation to look at the wrong leaf. Come on, come on. Pot released last week is to look at the wrong leaf where there's a leaf in our flag bringing healing yeah. to the nations of God. God is using this country to, you say to yourself, how twisted can it get? How bad can it get? And it, it and we are, we are being molded so that God has a remnant revolutionary bunch of revivalists loosed in these last days to combat the spirit that's coming against the next generation. Because it's one thing to hurt yourself, but it's another thing to hurt that which is to come, the innocent. And God gets active when the innocent begins to get sacrificed in twisted sexual perversion. Sacrificed on an altar, God says, I'm bringing forth the spirit of Elijah, and that spirit of Elijah is going to combat that sexual bail spirit that's being loosed in the land. At the same time that Ahab married Jezebel, the prophet, the prophetess that brought Baal worship into the people of God's land, at the same time, look at verse 32. It says, uh, verse 33, and Ahab made a woman wooden image, and Ahab did more to more to provoke the Lord. Uh, to, of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. This is how the Lord is feeling in, in our day, in this land. There is more provoking the Lord in this hour than ever before. And it said at the same time as, uh, as God was being provoked, verse 34, it says in the days of hail of Bethel, he... In the days of Hiel, of Bethel, uh, he built Jericho. He laid its foundations with Abiram, his firstborn, and with his youngest son, Segum, he set up its gates according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken through Joshua, the son of Nun. If you remember in Joshua, I think it's uh, Joshua chapter 6 and verse 26. I'm not going to turn there. When Joshua was taken, when the people of God went into the promised land, God pronounced that that Jericho would never be rebuilt. If it was to be rebuilt, it was to be rebuilt at the, at the cost of the next generation of the person who rebuilt it. In the days of Jezebel, listen, in the days of Jezebel and in the days of Baal worship and that fertility twisted spirit that was destroying the next generation, in those days, a, a guy comes forth and he says, I'm going to rebuild Jericho. It was in the days of Ahab. And he says, and, and, and I believe they looked at it as an honor. He looked at it as an honor to rebuild a cursed place. At the cost of his own family. Yeah, and we're living in a day where people are actually taking sacrifices to, and sacrificing their own children to build cursed things. It's happening as we speak all across this nation. People are taking a stance and saying, I am going to rebuild that which is not pleasing to God. And I don't care. I'm going to do it as a sacrifice through my family. And, 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 and it's all tied to that Baal worship. Because Baal worship is all about the next generation. So in the midst of all this stuff that's going on, in all the midst of, of this rebuilding of Jericho, in the midst of, of, of this new worship, it says in 17 verse 1, And Elijah the Tishbite, it says, Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Now this is the first mention of Elijah in the Bible. Where in the world did he come from? Come on, come on. Where, where, was, where did he learn how to walk with God? Where did he learn about the things of God? We have no idea. It's like he comes out of nowhere and he addresses the perversion that's in his day. It's like he was hidden. 
Everybody say he was hidden. It was like he was in capuscasing, worshiping. It was like he was in a hidden place where nobody knew anything about him. And, he, and, and all of a sudden, at a specific moment, that the spirit that was on him loosed him to push back and determine and to show the perversion that there's going to be consequences if you continually go in this twisted way. There is a spirit being released on your life that is going to position you in certain places and you will not orchestrate it. You will just be led to be there and because you're in that place, it's going to bring conviction that there are consequences to unrighteousness and the perversion of killing the next generation. Now I'm speaking prophetically. We don't literally do that, but prophetically I'm, I'm t declaring the next generation is being destroyed and God cannot tolerate it and he's looking to you to carry a spirit that brings a, a righteous conviction against that spirit to show that spirit that you can't keep operating this way because if you continue to operate this way there's going to be consequences yes. because see the system that we have in place in this nation is thinking all of that that we can do whatever we can do in the name of progress this is to help everybody it's the name of progress and they don't think there's any consequences for doing this perverted act but there is consequences and it's being carried upon the people of God come on come on say I'm a carrier I am a carrier of righteousness of righteousness he just he, he just comes out of nowhere just comes out of nowhere the guy appears he stands before the king and he says it's not going to rain for a while come on in other words what he was saying it wasn't much to do with the rain what he was saying is all this activity that we've allowed into the nation has consequences what you're carrying in this hour is going to pronounce loudly to people that think there is no consequences for what is happening it will pronounce loudly that's why it's so important to stand up for righteousness right on. Right on. I said it's important yes, it to stand up for what's right you don't have to say a lot just stand up for what's right just live for what's right it's about the next generation I said it's about the next generation you are important to God you are important so it, as soon as he stands up and, and it, pu it pushes a conviction against the, the tide that was happening in the nation. It says God takes the prophet, he takes the, the, the man, Elijah, and he takes him to a brook called Cherith. Now remember, everything in God is progressive. This to me, kind of in the natural, this looks like, he, like he's, he's uh, having to hide or something. He's in front of the king. He brings conviction to what's going on in the nation. And the next thing you know, he's over by this brook getting fed by birds. Ra ravens came to feed him. And he's drinking from the brook. But it's not a backward step. And I, I need to tell somebody in here that you might feel alone. And you might feel like, you know, God doesn't really care for you much or... Uh, but he's teaching you to trust him. God is teaching trust to his body of Christ. That no matter where you go and what happens to you, you are precious to him. And he wants you to absolutely trust him in this hour. Now here's what the Lord wants. I just heard the Lord say this. This is what he wants to do. If you struggle that God's protection is not with you, or if somehow you think because maybe something seems like in your life it's backing up, you don't feel protected or you can't trust the Lord or he's not going to come through for you. He is your provision. I said he is your supernatural provision. Right now, you might be in a are you are you are you going to come through for me i don't know if i have enough to meet my you know get, can get through the week i don't know if i can get groceries i don't know if you're going to be my provision and god's saying i am developing you to trust me i am developing you to, to rely on me and know that i am your supply no matter how bad or isolated you feel i am building a trust because i'm taking you and building you into somebody that's going to help me bring down this spirit of bail and this sacrifice of the next 
next generation. God is not against you. He is for you. I said God is not against you. He is for you. And he is building you a trust. So if you're here tonight. Okay, let's just do this. If you're here tonight and you say, Pastor, I'm not 100% sure I can trust God. Like you got to be honest. I don't know if he'll come through for me. I hope he does. I believe he wants to, but I don't know, God, if, like God, I feel like I'm stretched in every arena. Can you imagine what the prophet felt like? <laughs> Do you know what ravens are? Scavenger birds, right? Right? Scavenger birds. Everybody say scavenger birds. How would you like a scavenger bird to feed you? <laughs> right? He was told to go to the brook Cherith and be fed by ravens. Ravens don't share. Everybody say ravens. Ravens, <laughs> ravens don't share. But every day he waited at the brook Cherith to be fed by ravens and drink at the brook. Ravens don't share. And if they do share, it's not nice food. <laughs> right? It's garbage. Roadkill. How many? Like, oh, a great new piece of roadkill. But every day the ravens would bring Elijah. And he, at first, if I was Elijah, I'd be sitting there for a week or two thinking, is the raven coming today? Right? Is the raven coming tomorrow? <laughs> and the raven would bring meat. In famine. There's famine in the country. It's not raining. There's no, there's no food. There's no production. And he sits there and every day, is, there, is the raven coming? Is the raven coming? Morning and night, the raven would come. And the raven would bring food. And the raven wouldn't eat it on the way. As he's flying. The raven would bring the food to him. God was getting his person to develop a trust that he was his supply. God is getting his people to trust him. See, he, he's not against you. He's for you. And he's getting you to trust him that he is your supply. Say, he is my supply. God is my supply. I believe prophetically there's people here tonight that are questioning whether God will come through for them in protection. Or God will come through for them for supply. If that's you, I want you to come to the front right now. Come right now. If you're, if you're struggling in any way at wondering whether God will meet your needs, the Bible says he'll meet your need according to the riches that are found in his glory. Because we're going to pray. We're going to pray that you're going to develop such a strong trust that he's going to come through for you. Glory be to God. Okay? Are you ready? Come. There's six of you. Praise you, Jesus. Come on. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. We're, I know we're having an altar call kind of in the middle of the message, but that's okay. You can trust Him. I said you can trust the Lord. Doesn't matter what it looks like. Doesn't matter in the natural if it looks like there's going to be anything or not. He'll come every day. I said He'll come every day. He'll come and meet you. He'll come and bless you. He'll be there for you. You are carriers of the spirit of Elijah. I said you are carriers. And there has to be a developed trust in his provision. Because he's going to use you. And you have to trust in him. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. One, two, three, four, five. There's one more. Okay. Hallelujah. Pra Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. The devil is a liar. I said, the devil is a liar. Right? The devil's a liar. He tells, he tells us, well, you know, God's not going to come through. He's not going to look after me. You know, I'm getting older. I don't know where the money's going to come from. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I don't, I, I, don't, I don't feel safe. I don't feel secure. What do you think Elijah felt like? But he was being developed. Right? He was being developed. You, you're, you're being developed. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. We thank you for such strength and confidence to know that we can trust your love, Lord. You're for us. You're for us. You're called for such a time as this. You're called to carry my presence, says the Lord, and you can trust me. I'll be there for you. I'll be there for you. 
Don't allow fear. Don't allow doubt and unbelief to come. Think it can't happen. The enemy will come and he'll bombard your thoughts to make you think it can't change. It's never going to change. It can't happen. But it can. With God, all things are possible. All things can change. We must trust him. So I speak into this woman of God, a deep trust, just a knowing of confidence on the inside that everything's going to be all right, that it's going to come through, that God is for her and not against her, that everything is working for her good to make her to be what you have called her to be in this hour. We praise you for it, Lord. Deep trust, a deep trust, a deep trust that she doesn't have to worry. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. A deep trust. A deep trust. Come on, church, pray with me. That it's all going to be all right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Elijah had to be developed to trust at a level so strong and so... It, it's all tied to the next generation. It's all tied to the next generation. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Deepen her trust. The enemy comes to destroy innocence. The enemy comes to destroy innocence. And to, and to say, it can never be restored. But it can. You can trust in the name of the Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your trust. Becoming deep and confidence going deep in us. Thank you, Lord. We trust you, Lord. You can do this. You can do this. I am called for such a time as this. Yes, Lord, I'm your nobody. I'm your nobody that's just going to stand up for what's right. And bring conviction that there's consequences to things that are wrong in our society. The righteous shall stand by faith. And Lord, we got to trust you. So help me. Help me trust you more. Praise you, Lord. Right now, the fire of the Lord is going into your soul. And you're going to find a confidence like you've never had before. To be able to just believe that he's there for you. He's there for you. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. You don't have to worry. You don't have to be anxious or frustrated. He's coming. He's coming on a regular basis to bring you what you need, to sustain you, to cause you to be the woman you need to be. Thank you, Lord, for that strength. Thank you for that confidence. Hallelujah. 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 Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for that confidence and strength. We thank you, Lord. It's going to be fine. We trust you, Lord. We trust you. And when we feel isolated and we feel like it's not going to happen, we turn our eyes to you. And we remember what you've said. That you are, you are training us. That you're helping us to know and helping us to understand that you are day by day leading. You are day by day day leading in the name of Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Confidence. Come forth to know that you're with us, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. You're with us, Lord, every day. Even when it seems that we're isolated. Even when it seems like nobody cares. There's a flow of your spirit coming through our life. And even if you have to use a raven, even if you have to use something of the world, even if you have to use something that's unconventional, Lord, bring it on. I trust that you can bring on whatever you need to bring on in the name of Jesus. We give you praise. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. We speak great confidence over the church of Jesus Christ in this campus casing area. We speak that this, this place is a place that the spirit of Elijah is going to rise up from. A re remnant, revolutionary bunch of revivalists are going to come forth in the spirit of Elijah to be everything that God has called them to be. To push back tides in Jesus' name. Tides of unrighteousness and tides of perversion in the name of Jesus. Glory be to God. Somebody give Jesus praise. Praise your holy name, Lord. Praise your holy name. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Glory to God. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, in the story, we, after a long season of time, he's getting fed by these birds. He's drinking from the brook. The brook dries up, and he doesn't leave. He's got nothing to drink. 
But he's not going to go nowhere because his provision was there. He learned how to trust the Lord. And he knew that if he didn't get a word from God, he wasn't going to move on. He had a word to go there and he's not going to go anywhere else until he gets another word from God. God is looking for those that listen to him. God is looking for those who have an ear to hear what he's saying. That won't move just on emotion. Just won't move because it's a good idea. But will move because they hear the Lord. When they hear the Lord, they will make their move. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the Bible says, oh, I love this story. And the Bible says that the ravens, verse 6, uh, 17, verse 6, the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening and he drank from the brook and it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Whoa, praise God. He got a word from God. Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he rose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed there was a widow gathering sticks, and he called her and said, Please bring me a little water and a cup that I may drink. And she, uh, as she was going to get it, he called her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a little flour in a bin and a little oil in the jar. And see, I gather a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that he may eat and die. Now there's a plan. I'm going to eat with my son and we're going to die. The brook dries up. You know the story probably. The brook dries up and the word of the Lord says, go to Sidon. Go to Zarephath. Leave Israel. Where Baal worship has, has become rampant. F fertility gods sacrificing the next generation, which is the seed, right. which is the seed. Right. The fertility God wanted the seed of the next generation. He goes to the brook, learns how to obey and follow the leading of the Lord. The Lord says, now I want you to go to Sidon. If you remember back up in the scriptures, and I got to show you something because this is where I need to get to. It says in verse 31, And it came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, Ahab, that is, that, that he took as a wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of the Sidonians. Now here's what you got to see. Elijah isn't being punished to go to the brook. He's being trained. I need your ear, Elijah. Because I need you to do what I ask you to do. Right You're not going to understand why I'm going to ask you to do certain things. You just need to learn how to reflexively obey. Right you need to learn how to reflexively obey. Right because if you just do what I say, I'm going to do great things. And you know what he says for him to do when the brook dries up? I want you to go to Jezebel's capital city. The one that brought the perversion to the country. That's good. <laughs> She's from Sidon. She's the princess of Sidon. She's the king's kid from Sidon. I want you to go to Sidon. <laughs> and I want you to come under the principality of the perversion that has come into your land. I want you to go to Sidon and at the gate of the city of Zarephath, there's going to be a mother with the next generation. Come on, come on. They brought the perversion of fertility and weirdness and the curse of the next generation into your land. You're going to go into the cursed land from where it came from and deal with the next generation. Come on. It's good. What's come to pervert your generation in Israel and in, the, and in the church and in the people of God? You're going, to, you're going to go obey. Can you imagine what it felt like when he got the instructions at the brook after it dried up? I want you to go into Jezebel's hometown. And there's going to be a mom and there's going to be a son. Her seed's going to be with her. And Baal came into your country to destroy your seed. And you're going to go into her country and save her seed. 
You're going to go be led of me and go into the perverted country where Baal came from. And you're going to you're going to be the provision and you're going to be the light and you're going to be the minister that shows that the power of God is greater than any curse that can come on the seed of the next generation. God is going to begin to lead you. Yes, he is. And you don't have to figure it out. I don't know if, if I, I'm, sure, I'm sure Elijah <laughs> knew where he was going. He was leaving his homeland and being led into the place where that which was perverting his homeland <laughs> was birthed. And God says, there's a woman there with her seed. And you're going to provide the provision supernaturally to save her seed in a land that cared nothing about the next generation, in a land that sacrificed the next generation, in the land. There is a people today, you, that are rising up in your righteousness with a willingness and in the obedience of God are being trained and he's going to lead you to places. And it might not be profound to you and it might not even seem significant. It might just be into a situation, into a family. Right on. Into a family. Yeah. I, I got a testimony I want my wife to share. It just happened. I, I didn't get here to five to seven. Because this happened w to my daughter, who I moved in July to Medicine Hat. And we were just on the phone with her at ten to seven in Louie's house. And she's sharing this testimony. Come share it. So our daughter's a PSW, and uh, anyway, and so she went out without a job. She quit her job in Barrie and, and uh, went out. So uh, she was nanny, and uh, just the situation turned out very good. And uh, anyway, so um, she quit in that aspect of, of her nanny, these three beautiful little kids. Anyway, so she was living with our um, granddaughter, and she was just turned five today. And um, anyway, and so, uh, and her mommy. And, and uh, anyway, maybe phones and says, Mom, this is just so cool. So uh, Journey is our granddaughter's name. Journey's mommy uh, um, said uh, that she had this friend, Shannon. And, and Shannon told Megan about this grandma who her daughter had just died of a brain hemorrhage while she was delivering her baby. And she had three children, a four, a two, and this little newborn. And this grandma now was looking after these three precious babies. And she also had a spa and did aesthetics in home. And then grandma was in her early 40s. Yeah, and grandma was engaged and her fiance left her when all this went on. And so grandma last night was praying with her pastor. Her pastor came and because the grandma was distraught because she was looking after three, three babies and was having her own business. And, and, um, and so they prayed in agreement last night till midnight that a Christian nanny would come and, and bring, come in and live in the home to look after these three precious grandbabies that have just lost their money. Amen. And so Megan, this Shannon, a friend of uh, our, our grandbaby journey's uh, mommy, uh, uh, said, Megan, go there at 2 o'clock. She's going to interview. Megan knocks on the door today at 2 o'clock. And, uh, and uh, the woman, the grandma says, uh, may I help you, right? And Megan says, well, I'm here for my interview, right? And she goes, what interview? And she goes, I don't know anything about this. Well, Megan said, you're looking for a nanny to look after your children. And, and the woman says, well, Megan, I want to tell they introduce each other. And, and she says, Megan, I want to tell you something right now. I am a Christian. I'm looking for a Christian nanny. Well, Megan says, I'm a Christian. <laughs> Just exactly what you're preaching about. So here's the deal. 
Here's the deal. The spirit of Elijah is leading people into opportunities to minister life to the next generation. So here's Elijah. He's told to go to the pit of what's destroying the next generation in his country. Yet he goes to minister the love of God and the faith of God to a woman who's about to lose her next generation. But instead of losing the next generation, we know what the story says. She, she gets the supernatural provision of the true God and it saves the next generation. Somebody needs to give God praise. There are potential, there are potentials about to happen in your life that you can't think are insignificant. God is about to lead you into the pathway of people. It might be on a, it might be on a bus. It might be in a, a store. It might just be on the street. It, it, Open your eyes to see that God's love and His power is going to minister through you to, to minister life to the next generation because the spirit of Elijah is for the next generation. It's all about saving the next generation. And we will be led. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many feel in your heart a witness that you're going to be used whether it's with someone or you don't care. You just want God to lead you to be yeah, but it might be you might be a man and you might say well you know uh, I'm not around a lot of families but you might you might be around somebody that says you know they have a daughter that's about to abort a child and you might just give a word to the father or to a grandfather that just switches their heart and they decide that they're not going to destroy the next generation but that they're going to save the next generation God is moving mightily in this hour and the potential is here yes. hallelujah what an awesome day we live in. When, God, when the enemy marks a country for destruction because their prophetic destiny is to bring healing to the nations and it looks impossible and it looks like the perversion is going to take over and it looks like the twistedness is never going to change and that the darkness is continually taking ground there is God and he says I got a righteousness in the land where are they going to come from? they're going to come out of nowhere they're going to come out of capuscasing they're going to come out of the surrounding areas they're going to come out of abuse they're going to come out of pain they're going to come out of areas that Nobody, where did these people come from? Where did this generation come from that cares so dearly to preserve the next generation? Glory be to Jesus. He's talking to us. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. I said praise the name of Jesus. But we have to be willing to have our perception, his perception. We have to be willing to allow him to go, take us where we might not feel comfortable. But we are voices and we are light and we are his presence going into dark places. I don't think Elijah felt comfortable going to Jezebel's stronghold mm -hmm. and being fed by somebody from that country and being the minister that was going to save her boy. And you know the devil, if you read the story, it goes on. Because you don't mess under that principality with that spirit of perversion without him counterattacking. And so that, that generational seed was saved. That boy was saved. That mother was saved. But then the enemy comes. After time. And mad as a hornet. Says you're not in my land preserving the next generation. And says I'm going to kill the boy. And the boy dies. But if you know the story is so wonderful. Elijah comes back and he lays down his life yeah. <laughs> on the dead boy's life. The Bible says he literally, and I'll read it to you. It says he literally lies on him. Yeah. Takes him to the upper room and, and the breath had left the boy. So she said to Elijah, verse 18, 17, 18, what do I have to do with you, O man of God? You have come, uh, you have come, <coughs> To bring me my, to my remembrance my sin and to kill my son. He said to her, give me your son. He takes her out, and, uh, out of her arms and carries the boy into the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord, have you also brought tragedy on this widow with whom I lodged by killing her son? And he stretched himself on this child. He, he puts his body over this body. He laid his life down. 
so this body could resurrect three times, three times. a completeness and the life came back into the into the dead body and the boy was resurrected the counter-attack of the enemy could not even work in its in his own land God always prevails I said God always prevails I said God always prevails and it may look like it it worked and then it didn't work it may look like the devil came back and took it but it's not over yet say it's not over yet all we have to do is lay down our life and believe God and believe that God can ra raise up anything he is the resurrection God he is the resurrection life. He is the resurrection power. Glory be to his name. Glory be to his name. And if it takes me laying my life down so the next generation seed can come to life, then I'll lay my life down to see that seed resurrected. It's not over. They may look like they're done. They may look like they're hooked on drugs. They may look like they're never coming back. They may look like it never can change. But it is not over. Death will not reign. I said death will not reign. All they need is some Somebody praying and laying down their lives and breathing life on them and if, and God says that spirit will bring them back to life in the name of Jesus that's the Elijah spirit that God wants to move with through and in you and cause you to bring life to the next generation yeah it's going to be a battle it's going to be a battle this thing has come in I said it's come in but God needs somebody that's obedient enough to follow him to where we need to go. If it means moving to Medicine Hat for no intensive real reason to get position in a household where a spirit-filled Christian grandma is desperate because she lost her daughter in childbirth to an aneurysm. Man. And now she's got the grandbabies. The one she loves leaves because he can't handle the responsibility. She's left all alone. And a girl comes to the door, knocks on the door and said, I hear you need a nanny. Where'd you hear that from? <laughs> Didn't know. And there she is. And she Megan says, yeah, I'm a Christian. My dad's a pastor in Barry. <laughs> is God's hand on that? Is it random? No. It's willing to obey. It's willing to follow the leading of the Lord. It's willing to go where he says. And, and not to look at anything as insignificant. I'm telling you, your life is being led by the Spirit of God. If you allow him to lead it, everything is significant. That's why I'm in Kappa's casing. It's significant here. It is significant here. Every place is significant. Every place we place our feet and are led by the Spirit of God. I don't care if there's one person. I don't care if there's no person. God has led me to do meetings where there's empty chairs. I'll stand up. I All I had was a guitar player. And my guitar player says, nobody came. Maybe we should leave. I said, why? God told us to come here. Play! And he would play his guitar. And we would worship. And I'd preach to the chairs. And I'd preach to the people that are going to be impacted. And it does matter. It does matter. I said it does matter because the spirit of Elijah doesn't care about the crowds. The spirit of Elijah goes to where God leads the person to go. It doesn't matter about all the stuff the world makes it to be. It matters about the voice of God. Yes, I'll be led, Lord. I'll go to where you want me to go. If you want me to go to Jesse's homeland Come on. to be a provision to the cursed people. Come on. Then I'll go in there. Yeah. And I'll save the seed of the next generation. And when the enemy comes to say I can't. And tries to knock it back. I will lay my life down. Right on. Right on. And be what I need to be. Right Glory be to God. Amen. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. What a day we live in. Yes. You are carriers of the Spirit. We are. We are carriers. You are carriers of the Spirit. Say, I can do this. I can do this. It's not hard. It isn't hard. It's just obedience. Yeah. It's simple. Yeah. Lord, what would, you, what would you have me do? Where do you want me to go? If you don't hear anything, don't make anything happen. Go to work. Love your family. Yeah. Live good. And then one day you're going to hear him say something. Right on. And he'll say, just talk to them. You know, the seed in their household needs to be protected. Come on. Mm -hmm. And you'll just say something. Right you just love on them. Right on. And boom, mm -hmm. a seed will be saved. Right 
the generation to come will be preserved. Yes. One, does matter. One, does matter. One does matter. One does matter. One does matter. See, we got to get out of our head that we need. It only takes one. <laughs> it only takes one. It was the destruction of Jezebel and her spirit that came in a later time because the spirit of Elijah was willing to go after the one. One does matter. Get it out of your head that it needs to be a crowd. And if not a lot of things, uh, a lot of people are there, then nothing's happening. It's all about one. One does matter. You know that Jesus over and over and over again in his ministry would leave the crowds to go for the one. Right on. Right on. He'd leave revivals to go for the one. He'd leave this place and go to a well and minister to the one. Yeah, right on. He would constantly go from place to place after the one. He saw the importance of the one. He was never looking for crowds. He was looking for the one. He was looking for the one who would follow him. He would look for the next one to follow him. He said, follow me. And they would follow one by one. He was going after the one. Constantly after the one. Looking for the one. You may be the one. You may be the one. He cares about each one of us. He is, he's knowing what we are and where we're headed. He loves us. He loves you. He cares for you. We live in a society that gives you a sin number. Come on. <laughs> and you become a number. You become a number. But you're one important person to God. Elijah understood this. The spirit of Elijah understood it. And I want you to know that he cares about you tonight. You may think, well... <laughs> Nobody cares about me. Yes, God does. Yeah, you. you may not have any family members that care much about you. Yeah. Come on. But who gives a rip? Yeah, well, come on. When God loves you. Jesus loves us. I said when Jesus loves you. Yeah, right on. If, if, if there's anybody here that doesn't know Jesus, like, I mean, really? I'm not talking about church. and I'm talking about in here, personal relationship. If you don't have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, get it tonight. I said, get it tonight. He cares about one. He does care about one. Hallelujah. Thank God. <laughs> Thank, I, so I, I say to him, why'd you pick me? Why this one? And he says, because I love you. Right? And I felt his love and I opened myself up to it. He cares about you. Is there anybody in here who needs Jesus? You need Jesus for the first time. You've never, you've heard about him. You know about him. You've gone to church. Somebody's religiously talked to you, but you've got to have him in here. That means a personal relationship. That means you get up in the morning and you go, hey. <laughs> how are we doing, God? Jesus, how are we doing? Just us today. Hey. Right? It'll help you love other people. It'll help you forgive. You've got to have him on the inside. Everybody good? Everybody good? Amen. Does everybody know how powerful you are? Amen. The spirit of Elijah. We're going to pray for that. We're going to pray. And then we're going to pray for you to know just how important you are in that spirit. Right? Can we pray for the spirit of Elijah to come? Let's just do it corporately. Just stand up. And if you're willing to receive this, see... When God goes to do something, He doesn't look for the notable. <laughs> he doesn't look for the significant. He looks for the nobody. He looks for the one in the hidden place. He looks for the one. Do you know what? He doesn't care. Uh, he, he cares not about how perfect you are. That's religion. Religion wants you to be perfect. He cares about pursuit. Say out loud. He cares about pursuit. He cares about pursuit. Doesn't care about perfection. That's what I love about, you know, he says to David, the king, he says, you're a guy after my own heart. The guy murdered people. He was a rapist. Had a lot of issues. But what made him after God's own heart? Pursuit. Every time he messed up, he said, help me, God. And he pursued. 
When he fell, he didn't stay down. Whip himself because he was unworthy. He got himself back up and he pursued his God because he understood God was good. God was good for, God was good for me. God is good for him. God is good for everybody. And he pursued. Everybody say pursue. Pursue. I don't care what your background, how bad off you feel you are. If you get up in the morning and pursue God, you're a winner. I said you're a winner. In the sight of the Lord, you, you, you're a winner if you're a pursuer. You just got to get up and look for Him. Be conscious of Him. Thank Him for His presence. Thank you, Jesus. Every day. Conscious of the Lord. Glory to God. We praise you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. Ah. <sighs>